Hello and welcome to Conquer's Corner. Today I have the privilege of speaking with Lord Lee of Trafford. Lord Lee has been a inspirational investor for many for a number of years now and more recently he's been writing various articles for the FT Money and that's where we met a couple of weeks ago at the FT Festival Weekend and many will know him for his um, very, very popular investment book How to Make a Million Slowly uh, which was published in 2014 and is still being read today and being purchased by many. He has a long history of um, investing going back nearly 60 years and of course um, as with his name Lord Lee is a, a peer and we're today in the House of Lords interviewing Lord John Lee. Hello and how are you? Fine, thank you. And uh, thank you ever so much for agreeing to do this interview with uh, me. My pleasure. I'm absolutely um, chuffed to bits that you've agreed. It was really a privilege meeting you at the festival weekend um, several weeks ago. Now, um, with all my interviews, I, I ask the individual and um, yourself, Lord Lee, just to give um, the listeners and the viewers just a background history on how things started for you. Um, you know, I, I know that you were born post war, 1942. If you want to start from there, just tell us. A little bit about yourself, please. Sure. Sure. Well, my father was a family doctor, uh, and um, uh, we, we, he practised uh, in the suburbs of Manchester. Uh, and um, uh, I, I not quite was born, but uh, I lived in my early years literally above the surgery. Um, I think like many doctors, um, he uh, had a certain interest in the stock market. Uh, I think maybe with some doctors, they think that perhaps had they gone into business, they would have been very successful. But anyway, yes. um, for him, the stock market was a hobby. And um, uh, from a very young age, I remember him uh, on the floor of his, um, uh, sitting on the floor cross-legged, uh, what, what he made his library, uh, with a pipe in mouth uh, and with two great piles, one of the Stock Exchange Gazette and one of the Investors Chronicle. And um, he used to uh, spend many hours working his way through those and uh, modestly uh, invested uh, his, his, his fairly small, modest savings. I think did reasonably well over the years. Initially, uh, I used to put his leg about um, his investing and the time he spent uh, you know, on the floor, as it were, with these magazines. But um, then I, I started to delve a little bit myself. Oh. Uh, and I um, uh, found it quite interesting. Uh, and then I remember also he used to get um, a, a sort of a weekly or monthly investment. I suppose it must have been like a tip sheet uh, from someone called Beverage. And I remember Beverage um, used to cover uh, companies um, still exist today, like Land Securities, yes. for example. Yes. I remember um, BTA and the Drayton Group of Investment Trusts. I mean, we are talking now probably um, uh, when I was maybe 13, 14, so that would be, what, 56, something like that. Yes. Uh, anyway, as a result of all this, um, I decided to um, uh, make an investment myself, and I bought, when I was um, 16, <clears throat> 45 pounds worth of shares in a company called Aviation and Shipping, uh, a company who owned one ship, uh, and uh, anyway, unfortunately, uh, the ship went down and my £45 went down with it. Of course. Oh, so okay. it was not the most successful or auspicious start to uh, a long-term investing career. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm glad to say that it didn't uh, put me off didn't totally. Put you off. Good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I resolved to do somewhat better. Uh, but that was the first investment that I, I mm. probably made. Uh, and... Um, I was at that stage at grammar school. Uh, I left school at, um, at 16, yep. having taken uh, O-levels, as they were known as in those days. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what to do career-wise, and my father took me down to London for a couple of days, uh, and I uh, was signed on for a, a course with the Institute of Industrial Psychology. Uh, and so um, I spent a couple of days with, with my father in London. We stayed at the St. Hermes Hotel, I remember. Uh, and um, so for two days, uh, I was put through my paces, um, being asked all sorts of questions, um, putting pegs in holes, 
uh, thing lights flashing on the screen and one one being asked to describe a whole range of, of uh, sort of mini tests. Yes. And at the end of these two days, the recommendation was that I should follow an accountancy career, <laughs> uh, which was the ideal base uh, they thought or yes. they recommended for a business career, commercial mm. career. Uh, and uh, at that stage, they said, um, uh, you know, no need to go to university or consider university. Um, possibly they didn't think that I'd be capable of getting to university. That may well be that may well have been the situation. But anyway, they said no need. You leave school at sixteen, go into the canvas office, and hopefully by twenty one, twenty two, you will be qualified. Yes. And um, that is what happened. And I joined and uh, did my articles with a firm called Royce Peen and Green in Manchester, a small, medium sized accountancy firm, st- still independent, I believe, in in uh, Manchester. Uh, and um, I earned 60 and the princely sum of four pounds a week and uh, I was qualified by the time I was 21, 22 uh, and I left almost immediately I have to say most of accountancy a lot of it did bore me uh, and I managed to um, uh, go into a stockbroker's office in Manchester uh, a firm called Henry Cook Lumsden uh, which was the sort of leading establishment firm in Manchester uh, and I was there for a couple of years mainly as PA to the senior partner and I enjoyed that very much and, yes. and um, uh, you know I found that they were paying me for something that, <laughs> for something that had increasingly become my hobby Right. Okay. Uh, and um, it was there obviously that I started to get plugged into the world of uh, small cap stocks and oh. regional companies Straight particularly and there were a lot of flotations at that stage. Uh, this was, we're talking about 1965 or so, yes. um, when a lot of companies went public to establish a, a sort of a base price for capital gains purposes. I see. Right. And so one was involved in quite a number of uh, flotations at that stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so uh, it was a county from, si- from 59 to 64, stockbroking from 64 to 66, and then I uh, left to set up a company uh, really on my own but with, with one or two other colleagues, um, a practicing accountant, a practicing lawyer, a company that specialised in amalgamations and mergers in Manchester uh, and that developed into a small investment banking group um, and I was involved there for a few years but right throughout all this time I was um, enjoying stock market investment on my own account with obviously fairly small sums yes. of um, uh, of money, but over the years, beginning to to um, uh, gain experience uh, and establish a certain um, you know a certain approach to it's investment. Yes, yeah. we also, um, as part of our investment bank operation, um, built a small banking group, uh, and um, in the early nineteen seventies, of course, we had. A fairly major banking, secondary banking crash. Absolutely. With London, when the firms like London and County crashed, the rumours about the NatWest. Yes. Uh, and um, a number of building and development firms, house building firms collapsed as well. And the stock market fell to a level, I would always remember this, mm. where, where so called blue chips, as they were known in those days, really safe big company stocks like the ICIs of this world, yes. the old days, a company called Thomas Tilling. They were yielding twenty percent or so, oh, and no one would buy them. There was there was no buying on the stock so market scared. at all. Yeah. People people were massively apprehensive, uh, and so you could almost give the give these shares away, as it were. No one was buying. Yes. Uh, and the thing I learned at that stage, of course, was um, that that the stock market can fall and call, can fall uh, for a whole mix of reasons. One never knows always why or you said you can't foretell uh, to levels where perhaps no one is buying yes. so one can't really sell and therefore uh, it made me absolutely determined not to ever invest with borrowed money ah yes so yes, yeah. uh, in my 50 60 years of investing now I've never borrowed to invest I've always invested and reinvested my own money and my own savings uh, yeah. And essentially, um, because I've always used my own money, uh, I've adopted over the years uh, very much a sort of conservative approach. Yes. Uh, and uh, I believe the keys, or one of the keys to very successful investing, 
is to avoid the losses. Yes. Now, you may say, well, that's fairly obvious, isn't it? Everyone wants to avoid the losses. What a silly thing to say. But what I mean by that is, is that uh, one, what, when one actually invests in companies, you're endeavouring to reduce the risk as much as possible. Yes. Because it's always the, it's, it's the, the, the loss maker in a portfolio which actually ruins the overall performance. Yeah, creates and I, drag. Yeah. Correct. And yeah. I draw a parallel between the stock market and golf. So if you're playing golf and the round is going well, and then on the 17th hole you hit the ball into the wood or in the river out of bounds, it can ruin the total round. Absolutely. And Good similarly idea. with the stock market portfolio, it, everyone will have their successes, yes. but the key is to avoid the losses. Yes. Uh, and um, so my whole approach uh, over the years has been, um, and I've not been, uh, I, I've not, I've not ad adopted this all throughout my life. But I mean, I've gradually come to it. Yes. If you follow me, um, I've avoided, uh, by and large, expiration stocks. Yes. Um, uh, I've avoided recovery stocks. Uh, I've uh, avoided uh, startups. I've avoid, avoided um, biotech stocks. Now, this is not to say that there aren't individuals who could do very well indeed by investing in those sectors. Of course. But it's very much a specialist sector yes. market. Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't got the, the, that knowledge. I, I, you know, I know next to nothing about the biotech world, as it were. Uh, next to nothing about um, mining or, or, or um, prospecting for, yes. for oil. Um, and so I keep well away. Mm -hmm. So I'm investing in basically established public companies that are are already uh, are already trading profitably, are already paying dividends, um, have been around ideally a good few years, uh, a solid, dependable businesses where the 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 chances of, of losing significant amounts are reduced reduced considerably yeah. so it's very much this conservative style of yes. uh, of um, uh, of investing and there are a number of things that i look for when i invest now which in a sense fit in with that overall avoiding losses yeah. conservative approach investing guiding principles for guiding you. principles yes Okay, I mean, you, you've covered several of my questions, which I was going to ask you later, because obviously you're a, you're a small cap specialist. So one of the things I was going to ask, and you've more or less covered there, is um, what's the filtering process for you? I know you like family, uh, lots, lots of family um, companies, family related companies that have got lots, lots of skin in the game. But when you're filtering down through the, that sort of niche and the UK listed companies, what is it you're looking for that, that enables you to have found those gems over the past 30 years? What you're trying to do, um, I can put it this way, is essentially to, to build up a, uh, a jigsaw on a particular company. Uh, and so you, you are um, mentally putting a whole range of pieces on the jigsaw. Uh, and these pieces would consist uh, in a normal investing situation or potential investing situation. Uh, you, one piece would be the profit record. Another piece would be the sector that it's operating in. Yes. Another piece would be the level of debt or whether it's, it's got surplus cash. Yes. Um, another is um, the stability of the board. Yes. Uh, to put it at its uh, most obvious and simplest. You know, if you, if, and, and I've made this mistake in the past, you know, if you see that... that, that um, uh, in say a three or four year period, the board has had two or three finance directors. Then it tells you that either the mm. chief executive or chairman is impossible to work with, mm. or there's something fundamentally wrong with the, the with academy. the business. So, yes. war so warning lights flash. Yeah. Another piece on the jigsaw would be: uh, Do the individuals who are running the business do they have uh, a, a, you know a significant stake? in that business, as it were. Uh, and I'm not talking about um, uh, share options, which, which in a sense are a one-way incentive. I, I'm looking to see individuals or families who've got serious money 
of their own invested in that business. And if I don't see it, then I won't invest. And that really is one of my cardinal, cardinal rules. And one of the reasons that I like investing in, in businesses where there is a, a substantial family, uh, family uh, or proprietorial stake, as I call it, is that uh, in that type of business, and of course many family businesses have failed over the years, and you've gone from the sort of clogs to clogs syndrome. Yes. But those bus family businesses that have survived, they're normally now run by a mix of members of the family uh, and uh, professional external professionals, external yes. professionals yes. as well, and, and there is a there, there is a combination. But the family probably hold final sway uh, because of their shareholding. Uh, and normally the generation in a family who are running the business at any one stage usually um, are uh, conscious of members of the family, maiden aunts, cousins for example, who have um, significant shareholdings in the, in the business but don't earn any income. Yes. Uh, by way of salary, so yeah. they're, they're not involved directly in the business, but they are dependent on their shareholding um, mm. to produce a dividend income dividend to maintain income. their lifestyle. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and therefore, um, there is, there is a, a, an onus or an obligation to to pay dividends, as it were, uh, and more particularly to use uh, to to approach the the running of the company. Um, and this is a word that is one of my favourite words. Um, in, in, in a stewardship capacity, Stew in stewarding the business. In other words, conscious very much um, of the inheritance uh, from previous generations, conscious also of the uh, members of the family not in the business who are reliant on the income, and conscious that, in a sense, there is... Um, an implied obligation mm. to pass that business yeah. on to the next generation. Ensure, ensure longevity of the Correct. business, yes. So, so um, uh, yes, one wants the generation running it to push the business forward, to expand it organically, perhaps to make acquisitions, but not to make acquisitions that effectively run the risk of betting the whole business, as it were, yes. uh, betting the shop on one particular um, uh, transaction. And if it went, if it goes wrong, you know the whole gone. thing. The whole thing, yes. Yeah. So, so I'm looking for essentially um, committed, uh, conservative management uh, when I'm when I'm looking to, looking to invest. So mm. one's trying to put together a jigsaw of a company, um, and you know I can look at a look at a, a, a set of accounts now, and in in. You know, or, or a minute or two, I yes. can tell whether it's the sort of company that I mm. that, that 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 really I want to invest. Yeah. Whether whether it ticks my boxes, yeah. whether it Making satisfies progress. my criteria, yeah. well, and it also helps that you're a trained chartered accountant. It originally. also helps. <laughs> it also helps, but, but 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 it also helps that I'm a chartered accountant because obviously you can broadly read a balance sheet. Yes. Um, but I but uh, people who who assume that you know one needs to be a um, you know, a clever mathematician or a clever accountant to mm. be a successful investor. You know, I think are totally wrong. Agreed. Um, mm. uh, you need, you need, in my view, two things to be a successful investor, um, and those two things are common sense and patience. And of the two, patience mm. is the most important. Absolutely. And the big mistake that that majority of investors these days make is they will not hold stocks long enough. They chop and change, they see a short-term profit, they yes. take it, mm. uh, they read about an, another stock or hear about uh, it through a tip somewhere uh, and you know, off they go um, selling something to yes. go into that as it mm -hmm. were. And so you know, they play around, they, they make a little sometimes, they lose a little, but, but really that's not the way you make significant progress yeah. or significant money in the stock market. The money that I've made and that I believe substantial investors um, you know, to take an example, probably the most famous, like Warren, you know, Warren Buffett, for example, yes, yeah. um, is getting into something and staying with staying it. Staying with it, yes. Uh, and so I've got quite a number of stocks um, where I've where existing holdings where I've um, you know achieved more than tenfold appreciation in them and still sitting there. Still sitting there. Uh, and in some cases, you know, where the where the the dividend income um, almost equates to the Initial, initial capital that I that I've actually put in. Fantastic. And of course, one of the problems in this day and age with the web, 
and the, and the internet world it, 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 it is because I think it does actually encourage uh, more of a short-term approach because people are pressing buttons and therefore seeing all their prices and seeing short-term price movements yes. and therefore the temptation to take a profit uh, is actually quite considerable. Yes. Uh, I mean, I follow my prices very closely, don't think I don't, but um, I'm not looking to, 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 to become a day trader. Uh, uh, you know, and, and those who treat the stock market as a casino, yes. um, I think, uh, are almost certain to, to, to fail over the long term. They may, be, they may be lucky in the short term, yes. but then they'll lose it probably again next time around. Um, whereas I believe that um, you know serious money is made by getting into something and um, assuming it's going well, yes. staying Stick. aboard and applying patience mm -hmm. to it. The other point, of course, is that, that if you are staying aboard a lot of these um, sound companies and, the, and smaller cap stocks, which are the ones that I invest in, uh, over a period, the likelihood is that a fair number of takeover bids will come in on your portfolio. Yes. Uh, and I've been on, over over the years of investing, I've, I've been on the receiving end of about 50 takeovers. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Almost exactly 50. So almost almost one a year on average yes. uh, for the years that I've been investing. Mm. Uh, and um, usually, of course, you're taken out at a premium to a prevailing price and, and move, out, move out at a profit. Yes. In some ways, I'd have preferred some of those very good companies to have actually remained independent and... Agreed. But that choice wasn't really presented to me as a small shareholder. Mm. I'm not really in a position to, mm. to, um, to block a bid. Yeah. It's taken out uh, of your hands. My, my, my term is a take under. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sometimes yes. It's, that's the case. Yes. You just don't want it to go. Sure, that yes. is absolutely right. And mm. so some very good companies have been taken over. Um, but overall, um, you know, the, the, the 50 takeover bids have produced, in virtual cases, profits, uh, and then once reinvested those those profits. So, you were investing, you you maximised your PEP, your ISAs, etc. And in 2003, you were deemed to be the first ISA millionaire yeah, from yeah. using that very same set yeah. strategy and the right. principles and approach. Yes, yes, I, if, if you'd like to talk a little bit about Please, it. Please, uh, because I mean, because I think <coughs> from the research I've done, I've done is around 125, 26,000 that you invest in right. and you turn into a million. That's right. In, in, um, when when uh, PEPs, uh, the precursor of ISAs, came out in, I think it was 1978, was it 78 or, or was it 87? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. It was. Um, I think it might be seventy-eight. Like seventy-eight. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't seventy-eight because I wasn't in the in in the House of Commons. So I think it was supposed to be in eighty-seven. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think it was probably eighty-seven, and it was, I think it was Nigel Lawson was the Chancellor then, and he um, announced um, as a as a saving mechanism, uh, Peps. Uh, and you're allowed, if my memory serves me correctly, to invest up to three thousand pounds a year mm. in, um, in in equities uh, in a, a sort of a semi-managed fund yes. um, called PEPS. Now, um, I, I recognise, and and that and the, the idea there was that that fund, uh, that PEP fund that you were in, your own PEP was free of income tax and free of capital gains tax. Yes. So I recognised immediately that it was really um, potentially a very attractive uh, form of savings and resolved to put the maximum that I could in in mm. those early years. Um, the difficulty initially was that there were very few plan managers who actually um, uh, did handle PEPs. Oh, uh, and yeah. of those that did handle PEPs, hardly any who actually allowed you to choose your own share to put in. Most of them had a, had a, uh, a, a list of, of their uh, acceptable shares, which you could choose from, whereas I wanted to choose my your own. own. Yes. <clears throat> so I had a, it was quite difficult finding a plan manager who would allow me to choose my own shares. And in the end, I found Midland Bank uh, Executor and Trustee, Midland yes. Bank X&T, and I opened a PEP account with them and put my £3,000 in. And I bought, um, I remember, £3,000 worth of uh, PIFCO, who were um, a Manchester-based um, manufacturing supplier of, a, of small electrical products. Um, and it was a company that 
ticked pretty well all my bo boxes, family controlled, long established, dividend yield, conservatively run, uh, lots of cash. Mm. Uh, and so in those early years, I invested the maximum each year that I could in PIFCO uh, and built up a holding in, in mm. PIFCO. Ultimately, PIFCO was taken over by uh, Sultan of the USA uh, and um, uh, you know, I made a, quite a good profit mm. on it. Uh, and all those dividends that I got uh, in those early years, I reinvested. So I, I've never taken mm. a penny so far, touch wood, out of my, out of my pep. Okay. So, um, by, by, uh, by, we started in 87, by 2003, um, what is that, is that 16 years? Yes, 16 years. 16 yeah. years. Yeah. Um, I'd invested about £126,000, I think, in total, uh, of actual sort of capital going in, 126000 going in, and that um, had produced um, a portfolio with the value of, a million pounds. Absolutely. So that's how mm -hmm. uh, we achieve the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the the uh, uh, the description. Yeah. I, su I su millionaire. And uh, since then, I put not much more into that uh, into that pet boy. It's now mm -hmm. an ISA, of course, yeah. developed into an ISA. Um, and uh, I probably put a total of one hundred and fifty thousand pounds in. Mm -hmm. In other words, another twenty five thousand yes. pounds or so over the years, yes. following on for the, from mm -hmm. that first. Yeah. 125, 126 mm. that I put in. That's brilliant. Um, because, and, it... and now I'm now within the the uh, ISA. Yes. Uh, I'm I'm getting a dividend income um, of more than 100 percent on the total capital that I put that in. You put in. That's fantastic. Because I was going to say because um, you were spoken to in 2016, Feb February 2016. And it, then it was alluded to that you'd, you'd reached the point of it being 4.5 million, yes. that portfolio yes, increase. It was. So we're now one year on. Correct. So you're heading towards um, a, a little bit higher. Yeah. But what I find staggering and what people don't understand is regarding the rule of 72, is that um, that you have averaged, uh, I think, from what my research has told me, about 12% per year consistently to get to the figure that probably, you are. It could well be that, yes. Yeah. I mean, there have been years when, when one hasn't achieved that, yeah. and there's been the odd negative year. Yes, but on the other hand, now. on the other hand, there have also been some very mm. good years. And, mm. you know, I remember there was one year where I think I achieved sort of 44% growth. Yes, yeah. Um, so you may well have averaged out about that. Uh, you know, I wouldn't argue with that ar arithmetical calculation. But, of course, the power of compounding when you are reinvesting those dividends, um, uh, you know, can be very substantial. Mm. And, and if you... If you do hit a number of, of you know really good stocks that do well, that that achieve the combination that we're all looking for, yes. which is a combination of rising profits and an upward re-rating of that stock. Yes, that's the combination, the double whammy that you're looking for, mm -hmm. and that's the double whammy that really propels a, a, a share price northwards. Yes, yeah, that's, the, the, the re-rating from the re-rating and the and the profits growth. Absolutely, and then because the family are orientated, they want to reward the family who are long-term investors so by increasing the dividends. Hopefully, the dividends will increase, yeah. and and so the whole thing feeds on itself. Yes, yes, absolutely, right. Um, one of the one of the things I noticed as well was that within your portfolio a very significant portion of it because when people think of, of small caps they think of cap, um, of a valuation market cap of maybe 250 million but yours significant portion of your portfolio is below 50 million I would say so I mean it's very difficult to know but I would I would have thought the average capitalization of the company would be probably about 50 million or yes. so but there are quite a number of stocks where where the valuation is more mm. like 20 million or, yeah. or even less mm. um, so um, it's the it's the characteristics that I've been look at that, that I always look for, not the sort of absolute value. Right. But on the other hand, um, broad brush, I do prefer the smaller companies to the larger companies, and I've all, I believe very early on, and this was sort of counter to all accepted thinking, that widows and orphans were as safe, if not safer, uh, in some of those what I term family or proprietorial smaller cap stocks yes. that are carefully stewarded by a family as compared with some of the large cap ones like the BPs and the BTs, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, or which have been, you know, over the years, frankly, you know, mm -hmm. in some cases, for a period, near disasters yes. for investors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they've had a very, very, very rocky ride. So mm -hmm. um, I've always believed that, that 
um, you know, the, the, the widows and orphans, to use a phrase, yeah. should focus uh, more on, on the proprietorial stocks yeah. mm-hmm. than those large, large stocks. Overly yes. established almost. Correct, yeah. correct. So, Correct. so one of your criteria is obviously to looking for companies that pay a dividend, but you're also concerned about they're not being too racy. Quite use a term that you used earlier, conservative, in the sense of they've got a low PE ratio as well. Low PE ratio, yeah. um, low level of debt, uh, or or be cash positive. Um, hopefully, a useful dividend cover. Um, you know, the dividend well covered by available profits. Uh, and and in a business that's established rather than um, you know what I what I term so many of the aim stocks are really hope and prayer stocks. <laughs> yes, there's another element of what you say in, in your in your book um, uh, uh, to become a millionaire slowly. Um, uh, you, you, your concern, obviously, you've touched on it there, is to be cautious, be patient, and be conservative. But one of the words that you use in one, in, in one of the articles I've, I've read is about having cash on the side. And I think you, you use the term heart bypassed money. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's a found really br- a brilliant term to use. Sure. Can you um, expand on what that yes, means for you? Yes, what it, what it really means for me, uh, and I'm glad to say touch wood, I've never had a heart <laughs> bypass, I hope I never have one. <clears throat> but what it means, but jumping back, first of all, I made the point right at the start of, of, of this interview that, that I don't believe in, in um, borrowing money to invest in the stock market. Uh, I mean, probably if, I'd have, if I had done that, um, you know, given the overall performance, probably I would have made money. But nevertheless, mm. um, you know, if you're investing your own money, you can sleep at nights. So Absolutely. You don't want the bank or a finance house chasing you. Uh, and, and particularly the, because the retirement, the stock market really does, does fall. We know that it can fall very substantially. Um, so, um, rule one of the key rules: use your own money and don't borrow. Um, the second is. Um, to acknowledge that all equity investment, all investment in shares, involves a degree of risk. You can minimise the risk, um, but at the end of the day, you can't totally exclude the risk. Uh, some, and, uh, something can happen from left field, an event, um, an you know, explosion, um, a product recall, uh, you know, a war. Um, death, you can just never tell. Yes. Um, mm. And so, you, you know, there is an element of risk and you never want to put all your money, all your savings into the stock market. I believe you should keep a proportion out for um, family emergencies Absolutely. or, as I term it, mm. you know, the, the, the bypass yes. that one hopes never comes along. Yes. No, that's, I, I love that analogy. Thank you for that. You, now, one of the things I found um, in, very, very interesting was that you're obviously you're an advocate for buying stocks, but you're an advocate for not investing in funds. Now, for the majority of, of investors um, who are less experienced, one of the alternatives for them is to is to, um, to to pass on the responsibility to a fund manager to make those investment decisions for them. But you've never been an advocate for funds. No, um, no, I haven't. Um... She, to, to me, the stock market started off really as, a, as a, an enjoyable hobby. Yes. Uh, and um, that, I suppose, has developed into a really a core activity as far as I'm concerned. Yes. So I've, I've uh, had a lot of pleasure from it, uh, apart from hopefully profitable investment as well. Um, but, of course, I've, I've been prepared, because I've enjoyed it, yes. uh, to put a, a lot of time into investing, into you know, research, visiting companies, going to AGMs, yes. uh, reading city columns, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, now, I'm something of an evangelist, really, and I, my whole aim and thrust is to try and encourage more individuals to actually back their own judgment and invest their own money. And, and this is why I say it's not rocket science. You don't need to be a brilliant mathematician or a qualified accountant. You know, if you apply common sense to a situation um, uh, and and put the time into the equation, um, I believe you will do as well, if not better, than many of the the fund managers. Um, but you have to be prepared to to devote some time to it. And if you're not, yes. then okay, then pass it over to someone else, mm-hmm. a fund manager, to let them mm-hmm. handle it. Um, the only disadvantage there, obviously, is that they're going to charge you. Fees, of course, yes. Um, but 
There is no alternative mm. if you don't really want to do it yourself. But I believe that your average person, um, just giving it a little time and applying common sense, can do probably as well or nearly as well, as, if not better, mm -hmm. than most fund managers. And one very obvious point with some of the fund managers, because they have so much, so much money to invest, because they're handling very substantial sums, yes. uh, it's hardly worth their while to invest in some of the smaller companies that I'm investing in. Yes. Uh, and therefore, it's easy for them to gravitate to the larger companies. Yes. Now, there are certain funds that just focus on small cap stocks uh, or AIM shares or both. Um, and obviously, um, if you are going to invest in a, in a managed fund, then I think those are probably more appealing than, yes. than um, uh, some of the others. The other thing that I don't do... Um, uh, which links into this is that I don't invest in I don't invest overseas. I was going to touch I on that. I don't invest dire yes. directly mm. overseas. Um, you know, it, it's difficult enough to keep track of you know all the UK quoted companies, yes. let, let alone mm. um, you know understand the Japanese companies yes. or the Indian companies mm. or what have you. Um, but um, the way I approach it is because, of course, I accept that the. You know, the developing world, the third world, is growing at a faster rate yes. than, um, you know, the more traditional European mm. markets like yeah. the UK. Yeah. Um, what I'm looking for, ideally, are uh, UK-quoted companies yes. with a UK, UK standard of governance, yes. which actually trade globally. Yes. Yeah. And, and so you're getting the advantage of... Mm. Uh, of um, Third world emerging mm. market emerging growth, markets growth yeah. um, but with the the disciplines, as it were, yeah. of the of a UK quoted company. Yeah. Not to mm. say that um, you know it's it's foolproof because obviously mm. there've been a number of scandals involving UK companies, Absolutely. so it's not totally foolproof. Yes. But by and large, um, you stand a better chance, mm. I think. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, you know, some of the companies that um, uh, people invested in China, for example, have been you know totally. Uh, um, totally sort of false companies yes, um, yeah. and um, you know similarly I'm not in, interested in investing in um, uh, you know Russian um, Russian mining stocks yeah, yes. or, or uh, you know exploration mm -hmm. stocks in in, in um, uh, Kazakhstan or wherever it is yeah so you I mean because you've um, I've, I've read it a bit before because you were involved with um, PZ Cousins. Obviously, that that's been a, that's been a global entity for global for, business for, for, with, for with many a many big years. Stake in Nigeria. Yes. Yeah. So they they've given you that exposure, and there's Correct. been Nichols, which is obviously the makers of Vimto or the, the produce manufacturers Correct. of Vimto. So you've had with, that with exposure. With a big, big sale in big with big market in the Gulf. In the Gulf it, now, yes, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. uh, because they're using that. And, so, and and there's another example, Tarsus. Who are in exhibitions and events, which yes, is one of my favourite companies. Yeah. They have nothing at all in this country. That's all amazing. all the events and exhibitions that mm. they run are um, abroad, abroad in America mm. uh, and Belgium. They run, they run the Dubai Air Show. Yes, but also a lot of um, their uh, their newer um, um, exhibitions and events are actually in the the you know they grow the Turkeys, the Mexicos, yes. the Miramars. Mm. Mm. Uh, the Morocco's yeah. countries like that, really. So, with Tarsus, for example, how long have you been invested in that? Because is that a recent buyer or an old I, I've been in, an investor in Tarsus probably for about probably the last three or four years. I would say. Okay. So it's it's for me. It's a new for me. <laughs> it's a, one of my more recent yeah. stocks. Yes. Brilliant, yes. brilliant. So when you were at the um, FT Weekend Festival, you talked about um, your investment in Treat, yes. which, I, which I found very interesting because obviously they're a global company as well. They're a global company. In flavors and fragrances. In flavors and fragrances, yes. Uh, and um, originally, when I first invested, it was a family business. Uh, there was a controlling family, uh, and then there was a bit of a, a bit of a boardroom coup, and the the, the family were forced out, um, and the professional managers took over. Yes. Because they were dissatisfied with the mm. way the family were running the business, uh, and so you know the family departed, um, and and sold their stock at that stage. And thankfully, the um, uh, the you know the professional managers who who, who were there before, yes. but came to then came to the fore as it yes. were. Um, they um, you know they've taken the business substantially forward, uh, and um, uh, it, it's a company that I've um, grown to like. Uh, it's probably my favourite company. It's certainly my, my largest holding. It probably represents now about forty percent of my ISA. Wow. Um, 
and doesn't and I've sold I think I sold eight percent of it so mm. it doesn't stand me at anything now nil yeah. cost right um, it's done very very well um, does dominate the ISA but I don't believe in in uh, uh, it doesn't frighten me mm. having that uh, having that percentage in one company because I, I do believe it's a superb mm. valuable business yes. okay. um, and um, you know hopefully there is a, a lot more growth to come the the team running it believe that they're only at the start of a a journey mm. and it's a company actually that that um, uh, it's an a, a, it's an example in a way of, of my approach I've bought into treat over the years on about 24 separate occasions so uh, you know having an, an initially put a toe into the water yeah um, then visiting liked it bought more added to it added to it as it were mm. and and obviously built up a sizable holding yes. and then the company sort of really took off, mm. uh, and um, so one had this combination of what I term uh, the double whammy of profits, growth, and a, a substantial upward re rating, and it's really created a very valuable holding. Brilliant, that's a really, really good um, way of going about it. Oh, I need to ask though, with regards to that sizable um, investment and all the stocks that you've got. I think it was only recently, or more recently, because you've been investing now for nearly 50 years, that you started to utilise a stop loss. Yes. Uh, what what, what preempted that, and how do you actually put that into place now? Sure. Um, looking back, um, you know, I, I, I made the point that, that the key is avoiding the losses. Um, you know, obviously over the years, like most investors, I have made losses. Um, I think I would have made fewer losses, or at least loss, uh, I'd have lost less money on those losses, yes. uh, had I applied a 20% stop loss, which I now do. Okay. Um, and what that means is that if you bought something and it falls 20%, um, then uh, that's, that's excluding where the market overall falls substantially, because that can happen. Yes. But where that particular stock falls out of line yes. by 20% as it were, um, then I say to myself, look, it looks like you've got it wrong, made a mistake, really probably best to get rid of it. Uh, and I say that because um, th taking that early loss obviously limits a much worse loss. Yes. Um, but also, uh, so from a financial point of view, but also from an emotional or confidence sapping point of view, if you leave in your portfolio a loss-making share, if it's sitting there, yes. every time you look at your portfolio, daily probably, every time that company is mentioned in the media, it reminds you of your holding on which you're losing money. Then it draw it pricks you, it draws blood. Yeah, yes. So so it saps your confidence. Mm. Yes, it does, yeah. So it's much better to get rid of it, take the loss on the chin, mm. forget about it, and move on. Now of course, you know, this is not a foolproof system because obviously um, there are shares which have fallen twenty percent, thirty percent, and then do recover. Yeah. So uh, all you can say is that looking back, uh, on balance, I would have been better off applying a 20% stop loss rule overall yes. rather than sitting on loss makers mm. in the hope, expectation um, that they will recover, recover if it yeah. were. Yeah. In a sense, trying to justify my original decision rather mm. than saying, look, you made a mistake, mistake. move yeah. on. I think there's a big call for that because what, what happens a lot um, with, with people I speak to and a mentor or some individuals is that it's, it's that um, difficulty with taking a loss. It's a big, big ask for them to say, right, I've got to just escape and get away from this now. They're, sure. they're so reluctant to do it. So anything that would help them to actually utilize that or take away the responsibility instead of set, setting a manual or physical stop loss so the responsibility is taken away from them sometimes sure. might help. Sure. That's what I believe. Okie dokie. Now, um, I've got a few more questions. So I will, I'm conscious that we've been, been talking for a little while. Um, I wanted to ask one of the main questions I, I ask a lot of um, in, interviewees is what's the greatest lesson you've attained since you started investing? The greatest lesson, quite, so, quite simply, is, is to be patient and stay in good stock, stay aboard. Good, love that reply. Um, I think you might have already answered this one. What has been your wisest investment decision to date? The wisest investment decision? Um, probably to to keep buying treat. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. As it's turned out. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, 
Given the many lessons that you've learned since you started investing, which one would you most wish to share the, of the many lessons? Uh, the, 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 I suppose it would be avoiding losses, avoiding risks, uh, and taking the long view. Excellent. Now, if there was one thing you would change regarding the current investing landscape, what would that be? Hmm. One thing that I would change, I think I'd, I'd, I'd change the, um, the basis of capital gains tax because at the moment uh, it's not a very high rate in all fairness, um, you know, it, it's either 10% or 20% depending on your own tax rate. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the, I think the, the fault with this present system is that um, capital gains tax doesn't take any account of the length of time you hold an asset. It's a flat charge. Very good point. It's a flat charge. And, and I believe that um, it should be um, more uh, tapered or indexed, as it were, so that um, the longer you hold a share, uh, the, the lower the rate of capital gains tax. Mm. So it rewards long-term yes, investors. Which yes, which encourages long-term investors rather than short-termism. Yes. So I wouldn't be against, um, you know, 50% capital gains tax rate for stocks bought and sold within 12 months. But I'd want to see it, you know, drop right down for stocks held for, you know, 10 years yeah. or so. Very good. I, I, li I like that idea as well. Um, if you were starting out today in investing, what would you do that you'd not considered or you were unable to do when you first started in the 60s and 70s? Well, I suppose I, uh, when I first started, there was no pet, there were no peps or ices. Yes. Though today they they obviously they do exist, something. as it were. So yeah. I think the the point is, if you're just starting now, immediately go into and make your investment through an ISA rather than make it um, you know direct, as it were, because you you do get the taxation advantages. Okay, um, I've more or less covered most of my questions. I've got one thing to ask you now. Obviously, you're a columnist mainly now for FT Money, and you've, you've right, I think you've written 200, over 250, uh, 250, 250, 250 and you've covered every single point I think there is to cover regarding investing thus far. Well, I'm if, not sure that you ever cover, <laughs> ever cover every point, but you, one, you know, one never stops learning. The, uh, moment, the moment you stop learning and think you're uh, you know, um, above it all, yeah. then I think you, you're heading for a slippery fall. Absolutely, I agree with that point, but we're constantly learning. What I was going to ask you, though, was with regards to those articles and the questions that were sent in to you, what's the most um, recurring question that's being asked about investing? I think the, I think the most recurring question probably is, um, you know, when should you sell? Uh, and I think the answer is probably don't, unless you unless you really need the money, as it were. Uh, in other words, you, you you view it as as if you are buying a when you buy a share in a company, you're buying a small small stake in that business, and what you want is that business for that business to grow. Yes. Uh, and uh, you know, therefore, your holding will become more valuable. So you know, I can't repeat enough: stay aboard uh, mm. and don't treat the stock market like a casino, chopping and changing, mm. sometimes betting on the black, sometimes on the blue, yes. or sometimes the black, sometimes on the red. Red, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, stay aboard. That, mm. that, that gives you the greatest chance mm. of, um, uh, of, of making a significant, mm. significant amount of money. Okay. Now, Lord Lee, obviously we're, we're in the, the House of Lords here. Um, you're a Lib Dem peer and have been since 2006. I've, I've, I don't really like to touch on politics regarding investment. I'm going to ask one question, if I may. Obviously, we're going through this potential transition and upheaval regarding Brexit. How do you see Brexit or whatever the situation is concluded in the next few years going to impact investors and long-term investors? So I think it's very, I think it's very difficult to say at the moment. Yeah. Um, all I would say is that, is that um, the, 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 the characteristics, the types of companies that I'm invested in, yeah. Are businesses that almost entirely uh, got one or two that just trade within the UK, but mm. almost entirely are, are globally global. established. Yes. They're global businesses, mm. often with plants abroad, um, certainly with substantial sales abroad, uh, and I, I think they will, at the end of the day, um, you know, be able to survive and prosper uh, on the world scene, as it were, mm. and not be too worried by Brexit.
Yeah. Other, other than your your own book that you've written, is there any books that you've written? Uh, sorry, read. read yourself that you'd recommend for other not people? That I, to? Not that I. Um, not that I. Uh, um, would, not that would immediately comes to mind. There's a, there is a book coming out that I've contributed to. Ah, go ahead. Uh, that, that Harry Madhouse are producing, and I think it's called something like the rules, the inve- investment rules, or the rules of investment. Okay. And I think this this features a number of individual yes. investors bringing their experience to bear. Okay. So okay. that is one that I, I'm going to look forward to reading. Excellent. And and perhaps is worth will be worth reading. We'll have to wait and see. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I've concluded my interview. That was Lord Lee of Stratford. Trafford. 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 Yeah. <laughs> to apologise. Lord Lee of Trafford. Um, speaking on Conquest Corner with me, Peter Higgins. Thank you ever so much, Lord Lee. It's been an absolute pleasure. My Thank pleasure. You, sir. Thank you.